Good morning. Good morning. If you have your Bibles with you, turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 17. That's where we'll be today. So we are all guilty of this. And we've said it or thought it. I don't know how many times. If this particular situation, let's call it situation X. If situation X were different, then I could be a faithful Christian. If circumstance X changed, then I could step up serving the Lord. If things were different than they are right now, but they're not. I could be who I know the Lord's calling me to, to be. I could be the Christian that I know He wants me to be. If this were different. But Paul, today, in 1 Corinthians chapter 7, is speaking to various groups of people in which their circumstances are different. Some of them are in slavery. Some of them have freedom. Some of them are single, some of them are married, some of them are widowed, some of them are divorced. And he goes and talks to all of these groups, various groups of people. And his advice to these people is not to seek different circumstances. He encourages them to be faithful in circumstances that they find themselves in this very moment. So what this scripture encourages us to do today is not necessarily strengthen our desire for things to be different. But to be more devoted, more faithful, and be different ourselves in situations that may or may not remain the same. So let's look at how he does that. If you wouldn't mind to stand in the honor of the reading of the word of the Lord. 1 Corinthians chapter 7. I'll read it all for you. Uh, verse 17 through 40. Verse 17. The Holy Spirit carries Paul along to write these words to the church at Corinth. He says, only let each person lead the life the Lord has assigned to him and to which God has called him. This is my rule in all the churches. Was well, anyone at the time of his call already circumcised? Let him not seek to remove the marks of circumcision. Was anyone at the time of his call uncircumcised? Let him not seek, let him not seek circumcision. For neither circumcision counts for anything nor uncircumcision, but keeping the commandments of God. Each one should remain in the condition in which he was called. Were you a bondservant when you were called? Do not be concerned about it, but if you gain your freedom, avail yourself to that of the opportunity. For he who was called in the Lord as a bondservant is a freedman of the Lord. Likewise, he who was free when he was called is a bondservant of Christ. You were bought with a price. Do not become bondservants of men. So brothers, in whatever condition each was called... There let him remain with God. Verse 25. Now concerning the betrothed, I have no command from the Lord, but I give my judgment as one who by the Lord's mercy is trustworthy. I think that in view of the present distress, it is good for a person to remain as he is. Are you bound to a wife? Do not seek to be free. Are you free from a wife? Do not seek a wife. But if you do marry, you have not sinned, and if a betrothed woman marries, she has not sinned. Yet those who marry will have worldly troubles, and I would spare you of that. This is what I mean, brothers. The appointed time has grown very short. From now on, let those who have wives live as though they had none, and those who mourn as though they were not mourning, and those who rejoice as though they were not rejoicing, and those who buy as though they had no goods. And those who deal with the world, though they had no dealings with it. For the present form of the world is passing away. I want you to be free from anxieties. The unmarried man is anxious about the things of the Lord, how to please the Lord. But the married man is anxious about worldly things, how to please his wife. And his interests are divided. 
and the unmarried or betrothed woman is anxious about the things of the Lord, how to be holy in the body and spirit. But the married woman is anxious about worldly things, how to please her husband. I say this for your own benefit, not to lay any restraint upon you, but to promote good order and to secure your undivided devotion to the Lord. If anyone thinks he is not behaving properly toward his betrothed, if his passions are strong and has to be, let him do as he wishes. Let them marry. It is no sin. But whoever is firmly established in his heart, being under no necessity, but having his desire under control, and has determined this in his heart to keep her as his betrothed, he will do well. So then, he who marries his betrothed does well, and he who refrains from marriage will do even better. A wife is bound to her husband as long as he lives. But if her husband dies, she is free to be married to whom she wishes, only in the Lord. Yet, in my judgment, she is happier if she remains as she is. And I think that I too have the Spirit of God. Let's pray. Oh Lord, we come with every circumstance known to man. And your truth is constant in a world of shifting circumstances. You are the only solid rock, the only foundation for us today. So help us to be rooted in you, to be content in our circumstances. Moreover, not just content, but faithful. It's what we desire. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You all can be seated. So here is the refrain that Paul repeats throughout the passage to people in all these circumstances. He says in verse 17, Only let each person lead the life that the Lord has assigned to him and to which God has called him. This is my rule in all the churches. So here's the, the bedrock assumption that we have to understand if we're going to understand what Paul's telling us to do. Here is that assumption, that the Lord has assigned our life to us. I mean, do you see it there? Lead the life the Lord has assigned to him. There in verse 17, Therefore, the Lord has assigned each one of us the life that we currently live. This is rule in all the churches, meaning that, that this isn't like some kind of Corinthian thing in which the Lord orchestrated their lives. But he didn't orchestrate our lives. He didn't orchestrate our circumstances. This is Paul's rule in all the churches. God is sovereign over our life, meaning that he's in charge. He's in control. Here's how Luke describes, he records Paul at the Oropagus that many of us studied in Acts 17. Here's what he says in verse 26 of Acts 17. And he made from one man every nation of mankind to live on all the face of the earth, having determined allotted periods, meaning God determines the two numbers on your tombstone. The first one and the last one. You have an allotted period of time. You have a certain number of seconds, minutes, and breaths, and every single one of those come from Him. Not only determine allotted periods, and boundaries of their dwelling place, meaning the land you have, He drew the boundary of it. The town that you live in, he drew the boundary of the place in which that you live. All of that, and if it changes, he changed it. He's in charge of all those things. He determine how long you'll live, where you'll live, how you'll live. And help us understand this, that God has assigned each one of us our life and our circumstances. That doesn't mean that when your spouse ran out on you, that you can blame God for that because that's his fault. He did that because he's sovereign over everything. Or if your child rebelled, that it was God in his heart putting that evil in there, putting those evil thoughts in his mind that caused him to do drugs and run out. 
God is sovereign over everything, so we have to understand that he is not the cause of evil. God does not cause evil. God is not darkness. He is light. But he is God in such a way that he has to give ultimate permission for events in his world. In fact, he has purposes that we don't even understand that he works about through evil. He works all things to the good of those who love him and are called according to his purpose. All things includes evil. He works through evil to obtain purposes that we can't see and that we don't know. Because he's God and we're not God. So he is the one in charge. But here in verse 24 of 1 Corinthians chapter 7, Paul is not concerned about the circumstances that each one of us today woke up in this morning. What he's concerned about is our faithfulness in those circumstances. Later on in this passage, Paul tells us that God is with us in our circumstances. So he is there. Then in verse 17, he says, This is the rule in all the churches, including Dryer and Baptist Church. So this applies to us as well. That we should be devoted to Christ no matter our circumstances. He gives us three examples of this devotion in the rest of the chapter. First one being religious background. Religious background. Look at verse 18. Was anyone at the time of his call already circumcised? Let him not seek to remove the marks of circumcision. Was anyone at, at the time of his call uncircumcised? Let him not seek circumcision. So all through the scriptures, at least seven times during this passage, Paul uses the word called. This is how the Lord saves people. As he calls to dead hearts, to sinners. This is talking about God's call to salvation. So some of the people at Corinth came from a Jewish background and they were circumcised and the cutting of the foreskin of males that many of us know from reading our Old Testament was a sign that they were part of God's people. So some of the people at Corinth were a part of a very religious heritage that they had. Now, and you go, how, in, how does that work that one could be circumcised and then go to uncircumcised, like you can't take a board and once you cut it too short, you can't stretch it. Well, I'm glad you think along those lines, that's exactly what happened. They would stretch the foreskin that was left in order to make it look like they weren't. Because what would happen in the Greco-Roman world is when they would work out, they would do so naked. So Jewish people, were easy to spot, and that's how this pressure built upon them. So we see two different pressures from the people who came from Judaism and the people who were Gentiles. Well, the, the people with the Jewish background had religion and the, the prophets, the writings, all this religious heritage. And then the people who were Gentiles wished they were circumcised and wished that they had received the promises of God from the Old Testament. So at the Church of Corinth, there's these two groups who have this pressure upon each other to be like each other. And they put this pressure on them. And they go, how does that apply? I don't know, Rob, the last time that you had a pastoral counseling appointment and they were wishing to remove the marks of circumcision. Well, I've never had an appointment like that. You're right. You're right. Nobody ever came to me and asked that. So far. I know somebody will after the sermon. Guarantee. <laughs> Not a question. <laughs> they will. I don't know who it's going to be, but somebody's going to ask. But so here's the thing though. All of us come with some type of background, potential baggage that 
the, the people that we are a part of may put pressure on us to do, right? So people who have come from a drug addicted, they tell their testimony and it sounds like uh, something that you can make a movie out of. And then somebody comes into the church and their religious background was they got saved at an age that they don't even remember. They've served the Lord as long as they could remember. They remember being convicted of their sin at some time. Maybe it was age five, maybe it was seven. Who knows? It's been so long. So you ask them their testimony. It's not as exciting. It's not something that they'd make a movie out of. It's very boring, which we need to praise the Lord for that. We don't want an exciting testimony from the world's standards. Every testimony is exciting because there is a dead heart, a dead sinner that was raised by the voice of God. So we want our children to have boring testimonies. Needless to say, when you look at these verses, there were people who came from different places and they felt pressure to be like each other. So what Paul's telling the church here is that it doesn't matter. These things don't matter. Your background doesn't matter. Verse 19. For neither circumcision counts for anything, nor uncircumcision, but keeping the commandments of God. So whether you're disobedient in your past, or you, you have an obedient past, it doesn't matter. This very present moment, you are called to obedience to the commands of God. That's what matters. Because that's basically the, the sum of this entire passage. And when Paul goes into all this, these things about marriage, singleness, being widowed, divorced, doesn't matter. Devotion, obedience, that's what matters. Keeping his commands. Jesus says, if you love me, you'll keep my commandments. So this is Paul talking to the church of Corinth, talking to the church of Dry Run, telling them, it doesn't matter what kind of baggage you brought in. You're still called to the same standard of obedience to this day. No matter where you came from in past days. That's the point he makes. Verse 19, whether we were religious or not, we should be obedient to God. It doesn't matter who you were. You're just called to obedience this very moment. That's what he does to him. Because nothing in our past disqualifies us from present obedience, right? Nothing you've done or a chart that you filled out previously, right? Can, in other words, so he's calling them all to obedience right now. And then we got two groups of people. There are those who said, I've been so unfaithful in the past. He goes, I don't care if you're circumcised or circumcised, whatever. Whatever the religious boxes you could check prior to this moment, I don't care. You're commanded to be obedient right now. And then there's these people who were so obedient before that they're like, I've been obedient for this stretch of time. Because I don't, I don't care if you've been circumcised for 15 years and you, you know the Torah and the commands. Be obedient right now. Not what you brought in, but you're doing this very moment. So we should be devoted to Christ no matter our religious background or secondly, our economic bracket. Pick up in verse 20. Each one should remain in the condition in which he was called. Were you a bondservant when called? Do not be concerned about it. But if you gain your freedom, if you can gain your freedom, avail yourself to, of the opportunity. So, a little background for us to understand this. Two-thirds of the people in Corinth, the town, were either former slaves or current slaves. So two-thirds of the people that are reading this have dealt with slavery that Paul writes to. So that's why he uses slavery as a second illustration. And his point is not that he accepts and encourages slavery. He says it at the end, don't be involved. But he writes this to people who are current slaves. He says if you can be free, that's good good. But when, were you a slave when you became a Christian? You can be a faithful Christian slave. 
So there may be pushback about why didn't Paul just come out and condemn slavery here in this passage right now? That would have been a really good time for him to talk about, wouldn't you think? Well, the slavery that Paul's talking about in Corinth is not the same as the blight on our country's history. Because slavery in the ancient Near East had nothing to do with race, but was a way that people could voluntarily enter into these things in which to get themselves out of debt or to provide for their family instead of starving to death. It was a valid option for people in this case. Ultimately, Christianity, the truth of the gospel, is what abolished much of the slavery that we know in our world because it's not compatible with the Christian worldview. But here in Corinth, it wasn't for life. Certainly there were cruel masters as well as good ones. But it was much more about your economic status rather than lifelong imprisonment because of your race. So apples and oranges is what we would call it when we try to compare the two. Paul tells them, you were a slave and the Lord called you. Don't let it concern you. If you're saved as a slave, you're free in the Lord. But, if you're a free man, you're still a slave to Christ. Verse 23, you were bought with a price, do not become bondservants of men. So, here's this principle that we take out of this passage. Whether we are rich or poor, we are owned by God. We are owned by God. So you may hate your job. You might be at the bottom of the totem pole, or you might have to look up to see the bottom of the totem pole. I've been there. I was part of the pole that nobody even knew about. They didn't even know that part of the pole existed. I was underground. Yet, Paul speaks right into this situation of people who likely wished that they weren't poor, wished that they didn't have to enter into slavery to take care of themselves. They wish these things. This is exactly the type of situation he speaks into to tell them to be content because their ultimate owner, your ultimate boss, is not a jerk. The one you may clock in for might be a jerk. But your ultimate owner and boss is God. Your ultimate owner is God. So that's why we can work as to the Lord, because He is the one who is in charge. He says, you were bought with a price. Once again, this is echo of what we read earlier. The Christian has been purchased out of slavery, ultimately, by the blood spilling death of the Lord Jesus Christ. Who, when we were far off, slaves to our sin, he set us free by the sacrifice of himself. And he owns us. So it doesn't matter what you have or you don't have. The truth is, is that if you're a Christian, God has you. Catechism is a question and answer teaching tool for children, just to put some background information on that. The Heidelberg Catechism of 1563 addresses this problem with question number one. Here's the question. What is thy only comfort in life and in death? Right, if you're in slavery back here in first... Corinthians 7, you're looking for comfort. If you're ashamed of your religious past, you're looking for comfort. So here's the answer to what's our only comfort in life and in death from this catechism. The catechism says that I, with body and soul, both in life and in death, am not my own, but belong to my faithful Savior, Jesus Christ, who with his precious blood has fully satisfied for all my sins and redeemed me from the power of the devil. And so preserves me 
that without the will of my Father in heaven, not a hair can fall from my head. Yea, that all things must work together for my salvation. Wherefore, by his Holy Spirit, he also assures me of eternal life and makes me heartily willing and ready henceforth to live unto you. So when we do not derive comfort from our circumstances, we can derive comfort from the very fact that the one who made everything owns us completely. You were bought with an extravagant price. So don't get caught up in being a slave to anything else. And if you're in situations that you can't get out of, you have comfort knowing that God with you in those circumstances. He owns you no matter what anybody else says about you. So we should be devoted to Christ no matter our religious background, economic bracket. Thirdly, our marital status. Beginning in verse 25, he shifts the topic to single people, saying he doesn't have a command to specifically quote of the Lord Jesus. He says this in verse 26, I think that in view of the present distress, it is good for a person to remain as he is. So he addresses single people saying it's good to be unmarried. This is people who are never married. This are people who were married. This is just people who are not married right now. He gives you four reasons, I believe it is, to remain unmarried. One, the present distress in verse 26. Verse 27 says, if you're single, it's good that you stay that way. If you're married, stay that way. It's not a sin to be single. It's not a sin to be married. But the truth is, is that being a Christian automatically enlists you into a war between God and and his enemies. So you're automatically in the war. Paul tells Timothy, if anybody desires to live a godly life, there will be persecution. It's interesting that Paul writes this to the church at Corinth, because if, at Corinth, there would come one of the very first martyrs in the Christian church. The Roman emperor Nero in 67 AD suffered from some type of madness. So he burned the city and set this massive fire and then blamed it on the Christians. Which led to a, a massive killing of people trusting in Christ. Including a gentleman who was from Corinth named Erastus, who was a treasurer that Paul talks about at the end of Romans. Thinking along these lines, it is good for one to remain unmarried because of this present distress that we all find ourselves in. So if you're single, you do ministry, you will be facing a serious pushback. And we talked about it before, you being killed for the cause of Christ or being fired for the cause of Christ, you wouldn't have to necessarily worry about who is going to be widowed and who is going to take care of your kids if you were a Christian. So the first reason to remain unmarried, the present distress, and secondly, worldly trouble. Don't elbow your spouse. This is not a good time to do that. And those of you in marriage know that it's difficult. It's a bad time to look at your spouse and say it's because of you. <laughs> Everybody face forward. <laughs> as, as one author asked the question, why should neurotic, selfish, immature people suddenly become angels when they fall in love? They don't. And those of you who are married know that they don't, or that we don't. 
As John MacArthur put it, marriage solves some problems and creates others. You just exchanged problems. That's all you did. So he's telling them this, that there's difficulty in this. And he says in verse 28, I would spare you of that difficulty. Verse 29, this is what I mean, brothers. The appointed time has grown very short. So thirdly, life's brevity. This vapor that we are, life is a vapor. So there's persecution and trouble and a short life to live, according to verses 29 through 32. And he says that the present form of this world, day to day as we know it, is passing away. Between verses 29 and 31, what he says is that those who, have, who are husbands should live as though they had no wives, and wives live as you have no husbands. Not at all, meaning that neglect your wife. Hey, I'm a Christian now, so I'm going to live on this end of the house, and you live on that end of the house. No. Did, were you all here for 1 Corinthians chapter 7, verses 1 through 7? He tells them, no, don't neglect your spouse. You owe them certain things. You owe them devotion, and you owe them other things as well that we talked about. Get the tape if you weren't. We don't have tapes, let's be real. Anyway. It's on Facebook and Dryer Back to Stop with it. But we have responsibilities towards our spouse. So what's Paul talking about here in verses 29 through 31? Urgency. Urgency. There is, whether you're married, whether you're single, life's a vapor. It's a balloon with a hole in it. The air is running out. Life is short. The older you get, it seems the quicker those days come together. What is this, 1998? It feels like it. <laughs> I missed a couple when I was counting them. Praise God for calendars. But life is short. It's too short for us to try to micromanage it and change our circumstances rather than being faithful exactly where we are. We don't have much time. The time is passing away. False teaching here, we have two brackets in these verses. Verse 29, time is short. Verse 32, the form of the world is passing away. So it's emphasizing this. Time is short. Things as you know it won't always be that way. Between those two brackets, he mentions marriage, mourning, rejoicing, buying, selling, and dealing with the world. As though to say, you should prioritize human relationships and the possession of your possessions with the fact that you ain't got a lot of time. So, therefore, we should focus on things that are eternally significant. Specifically, thinking through the application of this verse, a million years from now, the only things that will matter is who's in heaven and who's in hell. Not who we were married to or what we owned. Jesus tried to get to, uh, there is a trap attempted to be set on Jesus in Matthew 22, concerning this, the Pharisees and leaders came up to him and said, Jesus, there's this woman, and she married a guy, and he died, and then she married his brother, and then he died, and then she just kept marrying people, and they died. You might think about that story for just a second. Like, they should have investigated that woman. Like, maybe she was the cause of, I don't know, I don't know, sorry. I had an extra coffee. <laughs> <laughs> but here's the thing. Jesus goes up there and goes, they, they say, this woman's had all these husbands. Who's she married to when she gets to heaven? And Jesus says, you don't understand. It's not like that there. We like the angels in heaven who are not marrying or giving in marriage. So we know that in heaven we won't change identities. We'll still be who we are. But there won't be any need for marriage or 
picture of it because we will see what marriage is supposed to picture the entire time of Christ's relationship with the church will be all married to the lamb and eating at his supper that's what will be in that day I'll know my wife I hope I get to stand right next to her but he's grabbing their attention off of things that are eternal and placing them on things that are. Saying you ain't got a lot of time to do this. Therefore, you should be devoted to the Lord. Verse 32. Number four. He wants them to be free from the anxieties of life. The anxieties of life. Married people are anxious about worldly things, like pleasing their spouse. Like the person in the back seat saying, Daddy, 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 Daddy. And you go, what? He didn't want to talk, he just wanted to say my name. You know? <laughs> so you're like focusing on driving and not killing everybody. And you're like, what? The helicopter. Oh, cool. I can't look. I have to watch the road. <laughs> but we all know that our attentions get spread thin easily. And that's what he's saying here about marriage and singleness, that if you're married, you have a lot of things that you have to deal with, a lot of juggling that you have to do. But if you're single, it's easier for you to focus on things of the Lord. But as single people, as somebody who's single for a long time, I didn't find it easier to focus because I was just distracted with other stuff then. But he's encouraging them to be able to remain in their circumstances, particularly if you're single, to remain to be able to remain that way. So you won't have to deal with the anxieties of life. And I understand that I'm looking at these verses with a lot of married people, divorced people, widowed people, a few single people. So here's the point that Paul makes for all of us. Whether single or married, we should be devoted to God. Paul's desire back in verse 35 was not to chain you up for rules that you had to keep. That you can't ever leave your circumstances. but to promote you being focused on the Lord. The word he uses here in verse 35 for devotion has the idea of waiting alongside the Lord to serve him. That's what he's wanting to promote, is that you are there intimately waiting for instructions to serve. That's what he's requiring from us. In the thrust of this passage, it's not that you need to, things need to be different, you need to be different. You need to have this devotion to the Lord. So let's say the circumstances that we're struggling with are, are the same and they don't ever change. How do we be faithful in these circumstances? Well, I found with the kids, you have to wake up earlier. Want to, do, to be able to do anything with the Lord. Your work with the Lord has got to be done before they get up. Forget having a quiet time with toddlers. Forget about it. We have to adjust to carve out that time with the Lord. To be able to wait there beside Him saying, what would you have me do today? has to be made because it won't just happen. We have to make it happen on our calendar. It has to be this way. Do you look at your time with the Lord as you standing there by Him in His very presence waiting? I need strength. I need instruction. Or 
we neglect that because of circumstances that we're in. Truth is, we make our own schedules. Every single one of us. I mean, you may have to be somewhere between 9 and 5. But we make time for the Lord. Or we make time for something else. Right? Not one of us is there tight to where we go, ah, I can't do that. I ah, turn off the TV. Put, off, put away your phone. Go to bed at a certain time so that you wake up and you can spend time with him. Because what I find in my own life, reflecting on these verses, is our circumstances are our circumstances, but we take circumstances and turn them into excuses. Excuses. As my football coach once said, everybody, your excuses are like feet. Everybody has them, and your stink. And I cleaned that up for you. So we look at all these things, and Paul is calling all of these people to get beyond their uh, religious background, their economic bracket, and their marital status, or lack of marital status. I guess we all have a marital status. But to call beyond those things and say, no, it's not about these things. It's about keeping the commandments of the Lord, knowing that He owns you, and waiting there right beside Him for strength and instruction for everything you need. It is there with Him. Is your, are, are you using your marital status as an excuse? I'm single, so I can be slave to my job and travel all the time. Or I'm married, so I can't make time for this. Or I'm di divorced, so I'm broken and I can't be used of the Lord. No. He's advocating overall singleness here, He's, and that's good. But his main point is that that status is really nothing. What matters is your service to the Lord, your single-eyed devotion to Him. That is what He is telling us. So as we try to apply this to our own lives and see what it is that we keep tripping over in our devotion to the Lord, because thinking along these lines, I'm looking at my own life and I see the devotion that I want to have to the Lord, and then I see the devotion that I currently have to the Lord, and I, I try to figure out what the difference, what's between those two places, from where I'm at to where I want to go. You know what's between those two things? Me. I'm between those two. I'm the one between those two places, right? I'm the one in the way. So it was a call for me, looking at the verses, to repentance of these excuses that these people might use to say, hey, I, I'm circumcised or uncircumcised, or I'm a slave, or I'm single, or I'm married. He's calling us all to get beyond these things and, and place our attention on the things that are eternal. So we're going to pray in just a minute. If you're not a Christian, your devotion is to yourself. But what we're looking at from these verses is we are seeing that there is something, someone beyond you that is worthy of all your devotion. He is worthy of everything. Because what he did is came to the enemies of God. We put him to death after he lived the perfect life in front of us. He died on the cross in the place of sinners. Everything we've done against God in the grave for three days. And then on the third day, he arose. Victorious over sin, death, hell, and the grave, and all your excuses. Christ reigning victorious over all of those things. And he commands us 
does is put out a survey, uh, see what our felt needs are, and then get some feedback. No, he's in charge. He commands us to turn from our sin and trust in him. It is not a negotiation. It is a command from our superior who tells us to turn from our sin and trust solely in his person and work. That's what he's commanding for us to do today. Maybe on the screen here are themes. There's a list of three things that you might need to repent of. Maybe they are. So we're going to pray. We're going to be able to decide if somebody wants me to pray with them. I'd be honored to. You can pray here on the steps. and Nobody's going to bother you. I try to trip you out in the spirit or anything weird like that. We're not going to do that to you. You can pray here by yourself. If it won't bother you. You can pray with me. Maybe you need to repent back at your seat. The issue is not necessarily where you put your body, but where you change your soul. Right? So it doesn't matter where you are at in your seat or up here, but whether your heart and soul turns from the things that are tripping you up, to deeper trust and faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. If you're not a member of DRBC, we'd love you to be a part of what's going on and what the Lord is doing here among us. You can let us know that as well. If you haven't been baptized, that's your next step as a Christian. You can let us know that as well. Let's pray together.